Today we have uh, Libby Liggins from Massey University in Albany, um, who's uh, a member of a number of our um, projects. She's uh, involved deeply in the development of the data repository that Mick uh, talk talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh, and is also involved in high quality genomes. Um, she has a fantastic career, which started, I was delighted to find in a CV that she started at um, Victoria University of Wellington, which is an outstanding university for undergraduate education. Then moved on to a PhD in Australia, and has come back uh, and now has a Rutherford uh, Discovery Fellowship working at Massey Albany. And I was also looking through a CV and, and it says here that she was winner of the World Data System Data Stewardship Award for exceptional contributions to the improvement of scientific data stewardship through engagement with community academic achievements and innovation. So that sounds like a pretty fantastic um, achievement. So I'm really delighted that she's uh, here to talk uh, and particularly that it's gonna brighten up my Friday afternoon. So Libby, do you wanna take it away? Kia ora, Peter, and uh, kia ora koto e homa. I'll just get my presentation up. Great, so um, thank you so much for joining given what's happening in the world. I'm surprised any of you are here, but um, I'm very thankful that you are. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, some of my research, um, but probably not the research that I would usually speak about. So my active areas of research include questions usually related to population demographics of fishes and marine invertebrates, transitional communities, um, where I'm interested in edge of range population dynamics and species interactions and community assembly. I'm also interested in biogeography um, and do a lot of seascape genetics, including the use of biophysical level dispersal modeling. So the common thread or data type throughout my research is really genetic data of some sort. Um, but today I wanted to talk a little bit more about what I've been doing in other roles within science. So um, I sit on the steering committee for the Genomics Observatory's Meta Database and for the Genetic Composition Working Group for the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observing Network. All a bit of a mouthful. Um, I'm also a core team member of the Diversity of the Indo-Pacific Network and in New Zealand, I um, direct the Iramwana project. I was also recently appointed to the scientific committee for that world data system that um, Peter just uh, mentioned. And um, for those who don't know what it is, and I didn't know what it was before I became part of it, it's an interdisciplinary body of the International Science Council um, that promotes universal and equitable access to quality assured scientific data and associated services. So, um, for me, all of these roles that I find myself in really coalesce on enacting the idea of genomic observatories. And an observatory is a place that provides an extensive view or outlook. Um, and so according to that, a genetic, sorry, a genomic observatory is a site or an ecosystem that is subject to some kind of long-term scientific research, in particular, the study of genomic biodiversity. So in this way, the concept of genomic observatories try to integrate the unseen genomic layer of biodiversity with existing Earth observing systems. So why do we need to observe genomic diversity? Um, I'm likely speaking to a uh, agreeable audience here, but we know that um, what we do know is that just as species diversity contributes to ecosystem functioning and resilience, so too does um, the genotypes within a population that contribute to genetic diversity and confer similar benefits to ecosystems as species diversity does. And these benefits of genetic diversity in some, some systems can actually be of the same um, magnitude as found in, um, as those provided by species diversity stories. So, Sorry, so in um, monocultures or like stands of um, a certain foundation species, those genotypes can be acting, really, having really important roles in structuring the biodiversity around them in the same way that different species might have those roles. Genetic diversity and compositional populations can also provide us an early window into the impacts of some of the pressures on biodiversity that may not be apparent in other surveys. So, for example, a change in the demography or connectivity among populations can be observed through a shift in the genetic composition of populations through time. And increasing pressures such as change in the local environment of a population can lead to selective sweeps. Um, and we can detect these using genetic surveys, but they wouldn't be observable through any other form of biodiversity survey necessarily. And of course, most crucially, genetic diversity is an important facet of biodiversity to monitor because it really is the raw genetic material that a species or population um, uses to withstand 
and adapt to a changing environment over generations. And it is for these reasons that genetic diversity is recognized alongside ecosystems and species. Diversity is one of the three fundamental levels of biodiversity to be safeguarded under the International Convention on Biological Diversity. Yet we don't hear as much about this layer of biodiversity in terms of international and national biodiversity targets. There are several reasons for this, but today I'm gonna to touch on two challenges on observing genetic diversity that colleagues and I have been looking to address. That is that it's quite hard to understand, measure and monitor, um, and also um, related to data accessibility. So the accessibility of genetic data. First up, um, it has been said that there's a lack of explanation um, of genetic diversity by scientists working with that data regarding what are the measurable components of genetic diversity that can be used as indicators in monitoring. So to improve the situation, colleagues and I have been working on delivering a few measures of genetic diversity that can be used as indicators for managers um, and have similar attributes to other biodiversity measures, so it can be familiar to other biodiversity scientists. And these efforts um, are really important right now. They relate to the discussions that are in progress um, around revising the post-2020 global biodiversity strategy. So to support these ongoing discussions, we've published a few papers and policy briefs advocating for greater inclusion and consideration of genetic diversity in the goals and targets, including for wild populations, not just domesticated species. And we've also suggested some indicators to be used in genetic diversity monitoring for the direct inclusion in subsequent drafts of the global biodiversity framework. In the zero draft of the post-2020 global biodiversity strategy, there was actually no specific goals for genetic diversity. So um, we've suggested some where the focus of the next decade is to include wild species and populations and to also halt further genetic diversity loss. Then over the next 30 years, focusing on restoring the genetic diversity that has been lost um, so that these populations and species can become inherently resilient. To attain these goals, we propose three indicators that could be used, um, user, sorry, could, that could use already available genetic data or information, um, or potentially could use other proxies where there's an absence of genetic data. So these included for any given species, the proportion of their populations that have an effective population size smaller than 500, stressing that this indicator can also be estimated from census size and also conventional survey methodology where appropriate. Second, another genetic diversity indicator that can be estimated without genetic data per se was one um, to do with the proportion of populations still maintained from the species historic extent. And third, the number of species and populations in which genetic diversity is being monitored, relying on some ability for us to understand what genetic data actually exists for species and populations. So the information value of these indicators may seem quite low, but they do provide a baseline. And they also socialize that idea of monitoring populations and species for genetic diversity and not just being done by geneticists, but by biodiversity scientists and managers. So to complement these indicators and in particular to support indicator three, um, we've also focused on devising some essential biodiversity variables for genetic data. So EBVs are derived measurements that are required to study, report and manage biodiversity change in general. So they're supposed to be an intermediary measure bridging those primary observations, which is the data, and the higher level indicators of biodiversity, such as what I've just presented. They are intended to provide a common currency um, that all biodiversity researchers, managers, and decision makers can understand without requiring those expertise in genetics per se. So across the six classes of EBVs, which are shown here in the middle bubble, they should be equivalent in that they capture the critical dimensions of biodiversity for that class, they should um, be immediately informative regarding the relative state. Um, they should be able to be used across ecosystems and they should be feasible now and also into the future. So focusing on genetic composition, uh, we are proposing four main types of EBVs, which are very simple and likely very familiar to you all, um, such as genetic diversity, which is an alpha diversity measure, of course. Um, it includes a richest measure as well as heterozygosity, which is a measure of evenness genetic differentiation as a beta diversity measure, inbreeding, which is a measure of non-relationship to fitness, 
and effective population size, which is a proxy for the number of breeding individuals within a population. And we know it's related to that short-term inbreeding and longer-term evolutionary potential of populations and species. So together, these variables cover the forces that shape genetic diversity of um, mutation, migration, selection, and drift, and also those statistical properties of richness, evenness, and divergence that we really focus on in the biodiversity sciences. They're also known to be responsive to the pressures that populations face right now in the world. Um, and I'll just say that they've come about through a lot of debate <laughs> and um, in the end collaboration among a lot of different um, colleagues and also different genetic um, consortia, sorry, conservation genetic consortia out there. So they're currently under review, so we'll see what comes out of that, but this is where we've got to at this point. So on the basis of this progress and the generally huge momentum in conservation genetics community over the past years, leading up to this um, redrafting of the global biodiversity strategy, um, we're pretty well placed to be including genetic diversity observation in our national and global biodiversity strategies. So in a paper, um, some of my colleagues, they describe how um, routine research and monitoring programs, such as shown here, can be melded to provide the genetic EBE or genetic diversity indicators, even in cases where there is no genetic, avail genetic data available or genetic sampling is not routinely undertaken. So basically saying there's not really much excuse for us not to do this anymore. Furthermore, they make it known that um, these genetic diversity measures and indicators can be calculated for any species or population for which we already have genetic data, even if that genetic data was not originally collected for the purposes of monitoring genetic diversity. So I wasn't an author on this paper, but um, and while I don't disagree at all with the schematic and theory, uh, what I want to talk about now is how in practice, the feasibility of the second assumption really relies on us researchers doing more to ensure our genetic data can be made available for this kind of reuse. So as I pointed out earlier, the observation of genetic diversity relies on having appropriate data. We're now in our fourth decade of genetic biodiversity research, meaning we've amassed quite a resource of genetic data and that could now be put toward new and previously unforeseen uses. Owing to the developments in sequencing technologies, we continue to contribute to this data resource at an even increasing rate. And we're also looking to generate and apply genetic data to even more diverse problems in disciplinary settings. As you can see, as a result, we've had exponential growth over the last two decades in the number of sequences in public data repositories. And this is all happening at a time when the scientific community is becoming increasingly open. So, for example, there's the expectation and the anticipation that we should all follow the fair guiding principles to ensure that all our data we generate is ultimately um, able to be reused and repurposed. Um, however, the sheer amount of data and the different modes by which it's been generated and the large number of us contributing to this resource is really stretching the current capability of our data storage resources which also have their own challenging set of principles to aspire to. And despite our very good intentions in this open data age, what may be fair and equitable from a research community perspective can be quite different from a local community or indigenous rights perspective. So these open data principles in and of themselves do not necessarily ensure fair and equitable sharing of benefits that may arise from data reuse, for instance. Um, and as should be the case, um, this is supported by the Nagoya Protocol to the Convention of the Biological Diversity um, that pertains to genetic resources, and is also made very explicit through the CARE Indigenous Data Governance Principles. So all of these points that are relevant to the formation of a genomic observatory independently and collectively point to a requirement for maintaining the context and provenance of genetic and genomic data. So in my view, no one repository can do all of these things and deliver on all of these things that needs to be to serve a genomic observatory. And um, so what several of my colleagues and I have been doing is looking at where there are current gaps and inadequacies in our system that already exists. So we already have a system of interoperable repositories and data structures that we can use as a starting point. I'm sorry, my slides keep jumping ahead. The first obvious thing to look at was one um, to address the lack of stewardship of crucial metadata that maintains that context and provenance of genetic data. So by metadata, I mean the information or data that provides information about genetic data. We all collect it and we tend to neglect it more than we should. 
So it's created throughout the lifetime of a genetic biodiversity project. We continue to add metadata to our spreadsheets or possibly you might start a new spreadsheet to help us keep track of our laboratory progress and also to detail the methods that pertain to each sample. But we do absolutely nothing with all that metadata. So while we deposit our digital sequences into a repository in a standard format um, to NCBI or similar, we really have nowhere to put that metadata. Yet this metadata is essential for physically linking that genetic data back to the place, the time and the population, as well as the custodians of that population so that they maintain a connection and can benefit from the research outcomes. This metadata gap has several undesirable consequences, such as um, on the reproducibility of our work, our potential to reuse genetic data, and to ensure that that reuse is responsible, which would require some maintenance of the provenance of the data, as well as the information about the original relationship and the study context. So for the rest of my talk, I'm gonna focus in on some of these challenges, um, how we might overcome them, and what we can be doing as a research community to really help and overcoming those issues. So first, to illustrate that current policy and best practice is not really fit for purpose to ensure study reproducibility. Some colleagues and I looked a little while ago now at the efficacy of the joint data archiving policy and ensuring data were firstly accessible and that our research was reproducible, which was an assumption of the policy when it came in. So the policy stipulates that researchers must deposit genetic data in open access repositories and has since been enforced sorry, enforced by several leading um, journals. So what we did was we surveyed contributions to molecular ecology for two years prior <coughs> um, and post the policy coming into force in 2011, looking to see whether we could access the data and the necessary metadata or information we would need to reproduce the original work. We found that the policy is working. So after 2011, there you can see that we found that um, around 100%, really 99% of the data sets were being made public. <clears throat> However, we found that the data wasn't already always being av made available in a way that was informative enough for the published study to be reproduced. So the genetic data did not have enough metadata. So although we're religiously putting our data into sequ sequence repositories, it's clear that this current policy and best practice is not actually ensuring our research is re reproducible which of course is a central tenet of science and we should be doing that. Okay, so what then does this mean for data reuse? The original study doesn't need to be reproducible for some of that constituent data to be useful in a reuse case. However, in the same study, we looked at this and we found that this story was actually even worse if you're interested in reusing that genetic data to look at any kind of um, spatial or temporal trend in biodiversity or conservation data. So based on this somewhat limited study, um, although our genetic data was mostly findable and accessible, it really lacked the metadata to enable it to be reproducible or reusable. The majority of the data sets were not able to be reused, even after manual searching for metadata, let alone relying on some kind of machine readable or programmatically accessible um, data, which would require standards and metadata. And this is a real shame. Not only does it mean that we can't use this data for um, calculating genetic diversity indicators and EBVs like I introduced earlier, but it's also unavailable for macro genetic studies. So uh, in a recent paper published with several colleagues, we describe quite literally <laughs> the opportunities and challenges of the emerging field of macro genetics. This field focuses on addressing core evolutionary and biodiversity hypotheses using the genetic data of multiple species. In our paper, we describe different classes of macrogenetic studies, um, such as the coordinated sampling and generation of raw genetic data for several species that are often co-sampled in space, but these studies tend to be of quite limited geographic um, scale. A more meta-analytical approach that compiles published genetic measures rather than the actual raw genetic data. And overwhelmingly, the most promising approach, which is actually accessing that raw genetic data from data repositories, where you can have more control in theory on the filtering, the scales or aggregation of individuals into your analytical units, and you also have the ability to factor in aspects of sample size or sequencing depth in your analyses. There have already been several um, almost global macrogenetic studies 
of this type using um, raw genetic data. However, in all cases, these papers quote that these glorious depictions of the state of our knowledge are actually based only on around 10 to 16 percent of the available data. And this is due to that missing metadata. In this case, it's missing georeferences, um, rendering the, the rest useful um, for what is really essentially the most core spatial analysis we would ever want to be able to do. So what can we do to remedy this? The issue is that despite most of the genetic data being accessible, the metadata necessary to query these data and to recreate the genetic data sets has not been deposited anywhere. And this is where a lot of my effort and that of colleagues has focused in, a very, in various collaborative projects um, to inform those best practices and infrastructure development for attaining those essential metadata. So first, um, I'll start with the diversity of Indo-Pacific network. So this was formed in 2012, led by Cynthia Reginos and Eric Crandall. And it had two purposes. First, to form a collaborative network of scientists interested in addressing biodiversity and evolutionary questions across the Indo-Pacific. And second was to develop a way to enable this collaboration through the collation of data across research groups. And this required standardized metadata. So the collaboration worked really well. We have a large number of members spread across the globe um, and we all actively collaborate. Um, it's been a really great networking experience for me as a young academic. And together we've amassed the largest curated georeference metadatabase, sorry, <laughs> georeference sequence database in the world. Um, at present, most of this data is mitochondrial sequences, and that's what's shown here. But uh, the database has an increasing amount of population genomic data sets as those investigators now move on to those um, more genome wide um, methods. Most importantly, though, the broad collaboration has helped us to form a standardized metadata vocab and some best practices for population genetic and genomic studies. So drawing on existing metadata standards, such as the Darwin Core for biodiversity collections and the MIXIS or MIGS standards for um, genomic sequence data provided by the Genomic Standards Consortium. And um, through this, DIPNET has become one of two founding use cases of the Genomics Observatory's metadatabase or GEOM, which has created the infrastructure to really operationalize the de deposition and the retention of those metadata that we felt were important for our research community. So Geome is a web-based database that specifically captures metadata related to biological samples and associated genetic and genomic sequences. Here you can see um, the DIPNET data set in there. It makes it accessible and queryable to anyone within or outside the project. And this infrastructure can be used for any and all types of genetic biodiversity research. So as described in our recent publication, for those of you who are generating genetic data, Geome can help you to upload and store your metadata, as well as help you to prepare those pesky SRA submission files. It facilitates collaboration and making tissue collections and data collections visible and streamlining and coordinating data management across labs, whether you're intentionally collaborating as part of a project or a team, or just using Geome on a case-by-case -case or on a publication basis. And for those of you interested in exploring data resources, um, it has an interactive queryable interface where you can search by several fields or by bounding boxes, or alternatively, you can use the R package to programmatically um, query the database. So in this way, um, Geome has helped to fill the metadata gap providing the infrastructure for projects such as DIPNET, um, but also any genetic collections or publications. It makes these data findable and largely interoperable with other biodiversity informatic platforms. So if we then look back at our timeline for those for when those events influencing the accessibility of genetic data um, for reuse have really happened and how they might have influenced practice, we can see where the joint data archiving policy came in. And we know based on our previous study to expect that around that time and prior to that time, it's likely that only up to 30% of these data sets are likely reusable for any kind of biodiversity or conservation purposes. Around this time, there was also another publication um, about the minimum metadata standards for a genetic sequence. And this was contributed by the Genomic Standards Consortium. In 2017, Geome was launched with a publication followed by our more recent publication demonstrating broader use cases with a supporting editorial advocating use of geome from the editors of Molecular Ecology. 
So a lot of things are pointing in the right direction. And since this time, the um, Sequence Read Archive and several other open data repositories have also now brought on board the ability to retain some metadata within their repositories, meaning that GEOM is um, potentially less essential for some of those fields. Since this time, we've also amassed more and more data. And of course, we know this data is of greater value. It holds more information. Its reuse value is much higher. So the hope is that these measures that were put in place have really made a difference for that metadata stewardship in our research community. So uh, to understand if this is the case, some colleagues may have looked into this. Um, we surveyed the whole of the sequence read archive. Um, it was a big job. The and this is, sorry, this is the open access repository that most people deposit population genomic data sets into. Um, and when we did that, we programmatically grabbed all of the associated metadata we could find within the SRA alongside these genetic and genomic data. So here you can see by year um, that the, this data resource is very, very quickly growing exponentially, and it has a huge diversity in its makeup. But what you can see here is in the blue and gray um, that the spatial and temporal metadata is missing within the SRA. So despite the metadata fields now being available within the SRA, they're not being used by the research community. So only about 14% of the bioprojects or data sets that we looked at um, that we deemed to be relevant to conservation of biodiversity or conservation or biodiversity studies actually had the spatial coordinates and collection date. The type of metadata missing in between data sets really didn't differ between um, wild populations or domesticated populations or species, um, although georeferencing was a little bit better for wild species. And it's not shown here, but permit information was almost always missing, which is um, a real concern. So all in all, this is quite disappointing. Um, we've published these results now, but we decided that we want to do something about this. So uh, what we've done is we've worked to further qualify these results and also um, been looking to uh, retrieve some of the metadata for some of these valuable data sets, um, particularly of wild organisms. So we focused in on the red hash box here, which represents data sets we thought might be useful for biodiversity or conservation and reuse. So these were ones that were from um, wild populations and they had more than four um, individuals sampled, but they also crucially lacked that latitude and longitude which have been essential for their reuse. So to undertake this effort, um, what we did was we re-diverted um, uh, funds that were originally uh, put aside for a travel <laughs> an existing NSF grant for a travel, um, I guess, a, 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 yeah, it was like a distributed um, meeting that we were all going to come to sort of central hubs within the Pacific. It wasn't going to happen in 2020, so we decided to divert those funds to fund a datathon. We put up an ad in Evil Deer um, and also in Twitter, and we offered a stipend to any US grad student who was idled by the pandemic, maybe out of work, who wanted to participate in the datathon, receive a stipend, and contribute to research outputs as a result. It was unfortunate we had to restrict this to US students, um, and that was due to the NSF funding guidelines. But um, if you're interested in volunteering time to the datathon, like the many of us who are, um, please do get in touch. What we did as instructors is we came up with a really detailed datathon protocol for the students on how to retrieve the metadata for these data sets and to fill in the metadata template for upload to Geome so that these metadata could then be permanently linked with the SRA data. And we've actually um, since worked out a way within Geome where once that data, that metadata is curated within Geome, we can actually automate that pushing of that metadata into the same fields that are held in Geome where they are available. Sorry, same fields in SRA where they are available. So of the 1600 or so bio projects or data sets we initially selected, about 500 were um, deemed really relevant to biodiversity research and included in the rest of our efforts. And this is how we went at filling in the relevant metadata. So the um, dotted line on the graph indicates what data were already available from the SRA before the datathon. So anything to the right of that indicates an improvement post datathon. And although we dedicated a lot of time and we did retrieve a lot of metadata, 
we still found that we could only get around 30% of the spatiotemporal metadata that we would be requiring for reuse in biodiversity or conservation studies. We're continuing to collate um, and curate and upload any outstanding metadata for the original larger search of the whole SRA that we did. And we hope to create the most comprehensive analyzable data set to date in doing this. Um, but what's become apparent is that this is really a band-aid to a more systemic problem that still exists. So I hate to say it, but the metadata fields are standardized now. The infrastructure is developed. The proof of concept really does exist. We just really need to do our part as researchers, and I'm guilty as well, <laughs> um, and actually retain and deposit our metadata. It needs to be um, maybe a little bit of individual action um, and maybe a little bit more top-down uh, action. So molecular ecology advocating is great. Maybe it's time for funders to jump on board as well. Maybe some other journals and um, organizations or consortia to really make it some of their um, guidelines to their researchers. And this is where the Iramana project has tried to help. So um, it aimed to deliver a searchable metadata base for genetic data of Aotearoa's marine species. And it tried to do this through collaboration. Um, all in all, it was trying to create opportunities for data synthesis. So for those conservation and biodiversity analyses and to um, really enable responsible data reuse to inform future research and make sure that we're not redoing research that doesn't need to be done. And we've got a great baseline data set already. To do this, uh, we formed a collaborative network of researchers within New Zealand with the support of several international partners. And we've been using GEOM's infrastructure to manage the metadata associated with genetic data sets. So one thing of note here is that the Itamwana project is the first national implementation of a project within GEOM. And with that comes several very special considerations. Um, and it means that we've had some unique, I think, challenges and opportunities within the Iramwana project to look at ways that specifically making sure that our approach is Aotearoa New Zealand centric and that we can accommodate the ways that we like to work as researchers in a research community um, in New Zealand. So for instance, um, the project recommends that some of those standard metadata fields used in geome projects can actually be used to incorporate cultural information if that is appropriate and important to the community you're working with. So what this does is it ensures that that information is not invisible to the international research community who may not know to look actively for this information and in other metadata fields that they don't usually use. Um, but it might be information that that indigenous community or local community wants to be known. It's important for them that it is seen. Another way in which um, we've innovated within the Aramwana project is, um, has been working with a large team of other national and international collaborators to help operationalize the local context notices and labels. So you may have heard Maui Hudson speak about the labeling concept before. These labels and notices are visual signs that there are indigenous contexts that need to be considered. And the Iramwana project has worked to ensure that these notices and labels can be effectively maintained throughout that data life cycle by further developing geomes infrastructure and also creating new metadata fields that are appropriate for those labels and notices. So this includes the traditional knowledge notice um, and also the biocultural labels that help to identify the indigenous provenance of samples and data and that communicate the allowances and consideration for future use of those data. So ultimately these metadata fields aim to connect the data back to those communities that really should have governance over the data and should benefit from any biodiversity knowledge that is generated. So overall, the Iramwana project has been working to initiate better metadata stewardship of New Zealand's genetic biodiversity data, particularly for marine organisms. And to achieve this, I've run several workshops and datathons. Um, I haven't done one for over a year or so now um, because of the funding term, but also, I guess, COVID complications. Um, but the idea of this was to educate our research community around the importance of metadata, much like I'm doing today, um, and to also give a little bit of uh, guidance on how to and working with their own um, spreadsheets, which is like, I think, exposing your dirty laundry to someone. Um, we all have it, it looks terrible, um, but there is a way to, to systemize it, I guess, um, and make it accessible to the broader research community. <laughs>
So our overall goal here was getting the research community using Geome because it makes this stuff easier. Um, and at the end of the day, it will help us to consolidate that metadata that we want to potentially have on hand so we can monitor and look after the genetic biodiversity layer in New Zealand. So we now have an Iramwana team within Geome and a metadata template has been created that ensures all deposited metadata conforms to a minimum set of metadata fields um, that's internationally prescribed, but also a few other considerations that we um, collectively through the course of the project um, has come to our attention that certain other fields are important to our user cases. This is a screen grab from the Iramwana team on Geome presently, uh, where we have metadata entered for just over 3,000 samples that are linked to genetic or genomic sequences. So these gains to date are quite modest, um, but my hope is that as network members start using the metadata template, I'm hopeful that we'll start to retain more of that metadata um, that people are generating now in the course of their research. If you want to explore what it might mean for you and your data management um, to use the Iramana project or the genome infrastructure, there is a website that I hope will be helpful to you. And if not, get in touch with me. Um, and of course, alongside all these prospective activities, um, we've also worked to retrieve existing or historical data sets that are of value. Um, this has involved extensive literature review and the recreation of data sets and metadata. And these will shortly be uploaded to the Iramana project of Geome as part of an interoperable system forming um, a bit of a local, glo um, a global, sorry, a local genomic observatory. So the ultimate goal of the Edelmana project and a lot of the things I've been working on is a dynamic genomic observatory. So this is where the recreated or readily analyzable data sets sit in a data repository alongside scripts and tools used to QC and validate those data sets. And where we also have a toolbox of analyses to calculate and visualize summary statistics for the genetic data sets. And we have a grant being considered at the moment by um, GeoBon and Microsoft to fund, um, uh, I guess, a hub for uh, these genetic diversity analyses and the visualization tools that would go along with that. And of course, in all of this, the raw data can sit in either access controlled repositories, such as the Aotearoa Genomic Data Repository. Um, or it can be an open access repository. But in both cases, we hope that the use or potential reuse of this data would be mediated through the notices and labels that are applied by the local context hub that interrupt, interoperate automatically with Geome and also therefore the rest of these tools. So there's the vision. Um, it's very much under development still, but I do feel like we've come some way and I'd be really happy to keep you tuned on how these things progress as I continue on these roles alongside some very motivated and hardworking colleagues who I'm uh, um, eternally thankful for. So with that, I just want to thank all of these people. Um, these are really umbrella consortia organizations and um, groups of people. I would hate to try and name everyone and I've certainly forgotten lots of people, but thank you very much for Gen Genomics Aotearoa for including me also in their mahi. Um, it's really awesome to be part of a great vibrant group of researchers and I hope that um, this work that I do brings something to that team. Thank you all for listening and I'm very happy to take questions now or later if you want to dash off to the Cindy and Ash show I completely understand. <laughs> well I'm, I'll do the clapping that was awesome. Uh, Libby again that was an excellent talk and um, I think opened uh, a lot of people's eyes as to what we really should be doing with data and how we might do better. I'm really pleased that, that you took the time to come and Talk with us about that. So thank you very much. I'll do the one person clapping again. It's a little bit sad. Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, next uh, seminar in a couple of weeks is from uh, Maya Adamska from uh, Australian National University, who's going to be talking about coral genomics. Um, Maya is awesome. Uh, you all need to come along to that. So put it in your diary now. Other than that, um, it looks like some of us will be let out next Tuesday. Um, and I hope to see some of your lovely faces uh, in the next few weeks. So thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you and goodbye.